So hello everyone, welcome to Special Collections. Um, I'm Olivia and I work on a collection here which is on loan to us from Cashel and County Tipperary. It's called the Bolton Library. And the Bolton Library is an absolute treasure trove of material spanning almost 2,000 years. And in it is some of the rarest and unique material in this country. We human beings have believed in the existence of witches for centuries, but it all comes to a head really in the 15th century when a Pope, no less, Pope Innocent VIII, issues a papal bull in 1484, which basically says, yes, witches do exist and we might have to do something about them. So all the material you see on the table here from the Bolton Library comes after this papal bull in 1484. Unfortunately, we don't have a copy of the papal bull, but I think it's available online. So the material on the table here is from quite late in the day from the Bolton. It's from the 17th and 18th centuries. And we're going to start with one of the smallest items in the collection. It's this one here. It's only 80 pages long. But this will become one of the most influential pieces in this part of the world in the area of witchcraft. And this is not surprising because the author is none other than King James I of England. So the story goes that the young King James is on his way over to Copenhagen to meet his future wife, Anne of Denmark. And the sea voyage is beset with terrible storms. Now, whereas you and I might look at each other today and go, well, isn't the weather dreadful? Back in the day, it was absolutely normal to conflate what was going on in the world around you with something otherworldly. So the king and the crew, rather than ascribing the storms to meteorology, put it down to witchcraft. Then the king arrives over in, in the sophisticated royal court of Copenhagen and all anyone is talking about over there is the occult and witchcraft. So this is very real for this young king. And anyways, Anne and James hit it off. They get on famously, they get married, they go back to England. And a few years later, this item is printed in London in 1603. It's called Demonology. And it basically gives people in this part of the world license to hunt witches. And it's extremely influential. And sure, why wouldn't it be? The author is the king. And this is the same king, by the way, responsible for the King James Bible. We move on then another couple of years, actually a couple of years earlier than the King James item. So whilst this item is extremely popular in this part of the world, this item is extremely popular on the continent. And this is printed in Germany in 1601. And across six books, its author, who is a Dutch Jesuit called Martin del Rio, basically tells us how to A, recognize witches, and B, what to do if we meet one. So this basically becomes a witch hunter's manual, and it's extremely popular. On the continent, witch hunting, the persecution of witches, waned really in the 1600s, but this book continued in popularity well into the 18th century. So it was a very popular book. And we're going to leave these two very early items now, and we're going to move right into the 18th century with this item here. So this item is printed in London in 1705. So if you know your history, you will know that in the 18th century, we're in the age of enlightenment or the age of reason. So those disciplines which we wouldn't be without today, like um, the sciences, medicine, astronomy, these are beginning to take recognizable shape now in the 18th century. And the author here, John Beaumont, is a man of the sciences. He is a physician and he is a geologist. But here he is in 1705 offering this book on spirits. And he wholly believes in the existence of spirits, ghosts, apparitions, and witches. So our 21st century minds might find this a bit strange, but here we have, in the age of reason, the sciences happily cohabitating with the spirit world. Now, I'm going to finish with something a bit different, because to us in the 21st century, these three might be a little theoretical. They're, they're kind of, they would be hard for us to grasp, because we are long past the age of um, the spirits now. But here we are in 1698. This is printed in London. And here we have a description of an actual witch trial. Now, 
The persecution of witches dies out on the continent really in the mid 1600s, but it continues on the fringes of Europe and in the American colonies. So this is how you get the Salem witch trials. So this is a description of an actual witch trial. It takes place in Scotland in 1697 and this book, this uh, description of it is printed a year later in London in 1698. And the story goes, well, it's not a story, it actually happened, is that an 11 year old girl in a well-to-do house spots a servant stealing some milk and she tells her mother and the mother balls the, the servant out of it and the servant curses the girl. And nothing happens for a few days, but then the girl starts to feel unwell and she starts to have fits and she starts to cough up things which shouldn't be found in any human stomach, like nails and chicken feathers. And it eventually pans out that I think it's seven people are executed as witches as a result of this. And there are two camps today in what actually happened. Well, there's a third camp that the servant was actually a witch. The first camp is uh, the child made it all up and she was a very good actress. And the other camp, which I happen to believe, is that because people back then were so open to believing in ghosts and spirits and witches, that just the power of suggestion was enough to make the girl sick. It wasn't a curse, it was just her own body reacting to what might happen in reality. And uh, my belief is that the poor servant was just an ordinary woman who lost the head for a few seconds and there was nothing otherworldly about her at all.